we are, I guess most of you, all of us, we are developers, we want to have a lot of <coughs> choices. We want to be able to select the languages we want to use when we create our applications, we want to be able to select the runtime, the database, anything, the tools that we use when we create our applications. I might like some IDE, maybe IntelliJ, or I might like an Eclipse uh, IDE. I want to use my tools, the things that I'm used to when I'm, when I'm uh, working on creating applications. I also want to be at the same time, I want to be proactive. So this is one of the key goals that we need to think about when we are talking about developer experience, productiveness. So we want tools to be stable, not to change with every release. We want to have every function that we need in our hand. And we also want it to be intuitive. We want, them, we want our tools to not require a steep learning curve just to be able to use them. We want tools, the tools that we are imposed to use for a platform, for example, like an OpenShift, to be easy to use, intuitive. So why, why developer experience matters at the end for developers? Because users that use a good developer experience, at the end, they are happy users, and they promote your technology. They say, hey, I've been using this cool technology, and it's so freaking easy to use. And people will start using it just by the spread of water. And when you have enterprise-grade uh, products, maybe like OpenShift or some other uh, Kubernetes distribution, if the developer experience doesn't shine, the problem is that you will feel pain on, your, on a daily basis. You will be developing and you will be thinking, oh, this is so hard to use. I need to wait here a couple of minutes for things to be done. I need to learn all these new things. I don't really like this platform. I might not use it because it sucks. So, we need to think that developers, we are people too. Okay? So I think developer experience is really important because we just want to be treated as regular users. And the fact that there is the difference between developer experience and user experience just sucks. So we are people too, or many not. Okay, so developer experience, obviously we all already know what is both of the things. How can we improve developer experience? One way of improving developer experience is then there's multiple monitors. <laughs> hey, you will have a happy developer. I got so many screens to work. No. In fact, I have three at home, and usually I am like two. Why? Because it makes you context switch so much. It makes you distract so much. You are not productive. So this is not a way of improving developer experience. Developers, we just want to do our job. We want to focus on the things that are important on the things that matter. And what is important for us, for developers? The code. We just want to code and to make it easy and efficient. And that's it. We don't want to learn new things every time we go from here to there. We just want to have a Java developer. I just want to know Java. I don't want to learn any of these, any of these Kubernetes things or these maybe Python things that I would maybe need for something. And easy way to do. So today I'm talking about a new project that we are bringing up, which is called Audio OpenShift 2. And this is a developer friendly command line tool. Why command line? Because uh, when we start thinking about how to bring new experience to a user, to a developer, you might spend a lot of time maybe crafting a new, uh, a nice experience on the web UI or a tooling, but you might get things wrong. So the easiest way to test if the experience that you are creating is the proper experience for users is starting with a command line tool that most of the developers can use, that you can also plug your tooling to these command line tools through APIs. And then if they are successful and if your users feel like they are happy with it, then you can extend to all the areas, different aspects of the so what is audio? Audio is a command line tool that is simple to use. So it doesn't, doesn't really bring any new concept to you. It's, even though it's meant for you to create applications on OpenShift, on Kubernetes, it doesn't require you to learn all these Kubernetes or OpenShift very much. So there is a lot of things that OpenShift and Kubernetes brings to the table, like builds, deployments, uh, routes, uh, uh, the 
climate conflicts, and all these kind of things that are new to you. Why do you need to learn all of that? So this tool just tries not to impose new terminology on you, it tries to use something that you can feel comfortable using. It's also fast and it helps you with creating your iterative development workflow. So when you are a developer, what, you, what will your daily work look like? I do some code, I test it, I make some changes, I test it again, I add some functionality, I may test it again, and then at the end of the day, when I'm done, I may say, hey, this is ready for the whole set of my colleagues to use it. So I might check in the code into the central Git repository, and then maybe there is a central pipeline doing the promotion or the application lifecycle properly. Also, it promotes in-context work. So that means that you get into the context of one specific component, and we will see an example right in a minute. Um, you are working, everything you do is in the context of that component. Why? Because this is the typical way we understand developers used to work. When I'm working on specific application or specific part of the application, everything I do, I do it around this specific part of the application. So in audio, first thing we do is we create an application. And an application is nothing more than a wrapper or a, a holder for all the work that you are going to be doing or creating. So why? Because we understand that an application might be consisting of multiple different pieces, multiple different components, but an application itself is something that eventually you will be using in a productive system. So you need to identify all of the pieces that make part of your application. But it's nothing more than a wrapper, and when you create an application, nothing really happens apart from creating this wrapper. Or marker. Once you do that, you select what type of component you are going to create. And the component is the application or the specific part of the application that you are going to be creating. You are creating a web service, maybe you want to use Wi-Fi or Jetty or Tonka to create your web service. So a component is, hey, I'm going to work right now with Tonka or Wi-Fi. So create one of those and every time um, I create or, or I make some changes, make the changes focused or in context of that specific component. So that means that from that moment, everything you do, it will be done to that specific component. So if I want to, for example, create some storage or attach some storage to make my application uh, resilient. So if my application server stops and restarts, I want some configuration to be there on the application server. So I add storage. When I add storage, I add it to my application server, so I add it to my component. I might also need to do things like creating a database, adding a database to my component. I have a web service, maybe. I need to add a database so I can search into the available technologies that I have in my catalog. And then once I, I look the specific technology that I want to use, I just say, hey, deploy me one of these. But this is a service. This is something that I will use. This is not what I'm coding against. This is not every time I do some code changes, it will not go to the database. The code changes will go to my Tonka application or my Wi-Fi application, whatever that is. You might then say, hey, my application might be composed of more components. So I might have a front-end application, front-end part. Maybe a Node.js front-end web UI that gives me some functionality. So I create from Node.js source. I create a new component and I say, hey, this is a Node.js application. Everything that I do from this moment, it will be in the context of this Node.js application. So I can say, hey, my Node.js needs to talk to my Wi-Fi application backend. So I link it. What it will do is just connect it in the proper way. It, as you see, the term that it's using is easy to use, is link. But it, under the hood, it's doing a lot of Kubernetes difficult stuff, creating environment variables, config maps, secrets, whatnot. You may want to say, hey, I want to use my application, I want to make it available, trade me a URL for my application. It's as simple as that. Of course, it's opinionated, you can provide many different arguments to make it more flexible, but by default, it will give you the same default that you can use whenever you are developing. Again, in the context of your application, this will be done for your application. From that point, once you have created a URL, you can access your application 
through your web browser. And then, once you have all of this, something that is not easy to show in the diagram is the iterative development uh, workflow. So, what I do is when I create a component, I, say, I can say, hey, create my component from local source file. So, I got my uh, Java files. So, when, I, when I'm done uh, with my coding, I want to push these, uh, these files into the running application server. The application server at that point, or in, in this time the component, what it will do is build your Java, can build your Java application internally, and it will make your application available. Or you can say, hey, because I'm using Maven, and I know Maven works perfectly on my laptop, and I have everything on my local cache, in my M2 directory, I might want to just do Maven package, create the WAR file, and only push the WAR file to my, my component. So you can configure your, your application to use a binary uh, file as source. So when you create your component, you say, hey, audio, create whatever component, WAR file, use this WAR file, use this WAR file, and every time I do push, this WAR file will be pushed to the application server, and the application server will be restarted. The workflow that you will see is the same workflow you will follow on your laptop but it's working on OpenShift, on Kubernetes, and it's using containers, and it's using all this cool technology. And eventually, the good thing is that all those containers that you are creating will be the same that you will be able to put into production. So the, the life cycle, the, the, the application life cycle, is the backend. These are coming from GitHub. So there is two repositories that I'm using. Uh, we can do, go to the backend and get remote minus b, and we see this is coming from one GitHub repository of one of my colleagues, okay? So right now, I don't have anything. I just have a, I do audio uh, project, project set. This is just to set the context of the project I'm working in. Usually, when you are open OpenCV user, you might not need to use this. internet is really slow and here there is an engineer for this project and probably they have a really slow uh, uh, timeout. Is there a way that I can get a faster Wi-Fi? <laughs> this is the workflow that I show you, it's more or less what I was going to show you here. Um, 
blame the engineer, but sadly I have to blame him. <laughs> Otherwise it will see be my fault. Um, so audio, where you can get this uh, this tool? This tool is available on GitHub. Everything we do is open source, uh, and you can get it there. The slides will be available online. There is a recording. Uh, one thing that you need to understand is that designing a CLI is easy, but designing as an effective CLI, an effective CLI design, is not so easy. So we are not really sure how this will play out. So this is still the early stage of the project. We are now at a, at a moment that we feel comfortable talking about the project. It works, although this slightly uh, little problem that we have. Probably this is the first time we talk about this uh, project uh, publicly. Contributions as everything we do, they are welcome. And we want to hear your feedback. So if you start using, if you get the URL to the URL, you start using the product, uh, the, the, the command line that you, you think or in, there is something that we can improve, yeah, let us know how this will play with, uh, with the workflow that you will have as a regular developer using OpenSync because we think this is gonna be uh, pro it's gonna boost your productivity a lot if you are developing applications in OpenSync mostly because it helps you on this part that is not really something that OpenSync really provides right now which is the iterative development cycle of your as a developer so whenever you want to code and test code and test this is not easy you can do it, you can still do it with, with OpenShift, but there is a lot of commands that you need to learn. There is huge command lines with a lot of flags that you need to run. This makes things easier. Also sets OpenShift in a way, and everything that works on OpenShift in a way, that makes this iterative development cycle much faster. So please start using it, give us feedback, and if you think you are, this is written in Go, the project is written in Go, if you feel like you can contribute, if you know go, yes. get in contact with the, with, the, with the team developing audio and contribute to that. And that's all, everything I have. So my job done, poorly done, because the demo didn't work. I'm sorry for that. And if you are curious about it, just come later to talk to me. I will try to uh, hotspot through my mobile phone and I will try to make a live demo to any of you if you, are, if you want to see it in live. And please uh, remember to visit uh, learnopenship.com if you are in the process of learning OpenShift. This is an interactive portal that we have uh, for learning OpenShift. Thank you for everything. And if you have questions, raise your hand. I think you have still five minutes given the demo didn't work. So you are up for asking questions. There is no initial setup. So this is, this is one of the things that we try to do, is we don't want to impose an initial setup at the moment. We might may need, or need to change our approach in the future, but we want to be non-intrusive. That means that if you already have an OpenShift installation, you just download the command line tool, just use it, the command line tool. If you are using Kubernetes instead of OpenShift, you will most likely not be able to use it because it's using, um, at the moment, it's using some OpenSync constructs. We are trying to visit what are the differences between the constructs that we are using in OpenSync and Kubernetes because we are not using things like build configs, which is OpenSync specific, but we are using rounds, which is OpenSync specific. Whenever I did the audio create, a uh, URL create, what it does is it behind the scenes creates a, a route. If you are in, in, in playing Kubernetes, there is no routes, there is ingress. So we, we might look into how to make that possible in Kubernetes in the future. Right now, this is just improving the developer experience in OpenShift. As I said at the beginning, the difference between OpenShift and Kubernetes is that OpenShift is a developer-friendly or oriented platform, while Kubernetes is not. You can develop, of course, on Kubernetes, but it's not as easy. So does it take the complete DevOps cycle? Does OpenShift address the complete DevOps cycle? Are you messed up without the right idea? So the question was, does it cover the complete DevOps uh, lifecycle? 
And the answer is no. This is this is for the iterative development cycle. This is for developers. So how it works is I'm working locally. I I clone source code to my to my laptop. I start working, push, test, push, test, push. Once I'm done, one of the things you say is I'm done. So you say change this application to be ba based on Git. And this is the Git repository. So from that moment, what it will happen or what it should happen is that you should have a pipeline just listening or watching this Git repository. You have pushed the code and then a regular application build and application promotion and lifecycle should start. This is Usually, this is how you could develop with Minishift, maybe locally, or even with a cloud platform locally, but it's for iterative development life cycle to, to make this process that right now is not so easy to improve your productivity. The, the rest of the part, the complete application life cycle right now in OpenSea is pretty good. So, thank you. Yes. So, which industry is going to impact the most? Which industry is going to impact the most? The question is which industry is going to impact the most. I don't think it's going to impact any industry at all. Uh, I mean, the only thing it's going to impact is the developer's productivity. So if you are developing in any type of industry, it's going to improve your productivity. It's going to be make you able to create applications faster and more in a more comfortable way. So one of the things that we are seeing right now is that many developers, they tend to develop locally using the, the current workflow that they have, maybe testing locally, not using even containers in OpenShift because that's easy for them to use. And going testing or developing against a platform, a hosted platform in Kubernetes or an OpenShift is really complex. The life cycle, the, the workflow is more slow. So productivity is not good, the developer experience is not good. What we are trying to do is improve this uh, developer experience to make things uh, easier to use and just to get the developers to start using uh, or start developing against containers as soon as possible. And I think we're probably out of time. Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for coming. And if you have any questions, let's come later. Yeah, but the, the workshop that we have today at 3 is not about local development with ODO, which we will probably do next year or, or whenever we feel we can do this type of workshop. My demo failure, so <laughs> just think about a full workshop. And the workshop we are doing is uh, DevOps with OpenSense. So we are showing how to promote applications from, from uh, development to promote it to uh, production, do blue with your application, use pipelines, and all these kind of things. So if you are using OpenSense users, just come to see us at 3 p.m. Thank you. So uh, next talk is going to about the awesome project GitQ. So Shahid from uh, one of the coolest startup in our Bangalore, Kasura, is engineer at Kasura and he's going to present about this project, GitQ. So give us a moment to set his laptop.